uh, we'll be joined by a few more people as, as time goes on. But welcome to the first of the uh, Seville Australia webinars for 2022. I think that's almost the first time I've had to say that number out loud. Um, people have come from far and near, including my wife logging in from the room next door, and people in Jerusalem and people in uh, Tasmania and in uh, Sydney and various other places. So welcome. Um, and a special welcome to Bishop Manib Yunan, who's our, our presenter today. And um, it's a great delight to have the bishop um, talking about a topic he not only knows well, but he lives because he is a Palestinian Christian. He's a highly esteemed leader over many, many years in the local Palestinian Christian community. And of course has worked internationally and globally with, um, within both Lutheran and ecumenical um, contexts. So it's to, um, a great delight to have Bishop Manib um, with us. And what we're going to do, Bishop Manib will speak for 20, 25 minutes or so, um, and then we'll open it up to questions. As we go along, please feel free to enter your questions um, into the chat area. And when we get to the end of the uh, initial presentation by the Bishop, we'll then begin to work our way through some of the questions. We'll, we'll try to pick the juicier ones first to give them a bit more priority, but we'll work our way through and try to cover um, all the questions that we can within the time. And the whole event will wrap up at the end of the hour. Um, it is being recorded. And, um, and the recording will be published on the Sabila Australia YouTube channel. And the best way to find that is to go to our website, uh, which is uh, australia.sabil.org. And um, from there, you'll be able to get a link across to the um, YouTube channel. So um, welcome to everybody. Welcome, especially to the Bishop and uh, Bishop Maneeb. Mm -hmm. Over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, may I first of all greet you uh, from Jerusalem and give you the apostolic, you know, greeting, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Amen. Um, well, um, you know, um, first of all, it's good always to introduce, you know, ourselves, but I would like to introduce myself in a different way. I always say I am a Palestinian, I am an Arab, Palestinian, Christian, Evangelical, Lutheran, and I myself I am a Palestinian refugee. Uh, so, I mean, um, um, I've lived in Palestine, in Jerusalem for 2000 years, you know. Uh, we Christians have always considered ourselves to be an integral part of our societies, um, and we have always acted in the, as responsible citizens. Of course, we love our country and we want to see that our country will, uh, uh, will enjoy peace based, based on justice. However, these days, it seems sometimes we are spoken about in the world rather than listened to when the topic is raised. Like everything else in relation to the Israeli-Palestinian situation, the life of our communities is made into a political football, a point of rhetoric or propaganda. And perhaps the first thing I request when discussing this topic about, you know, Christians in Palestine is not to generalize. The situation we face in the Holy Land and Jordan is quite different than what one has been experienced in other places in the Middle East. What we see in Egypt, Syria, Iraq, and other places is deeply concerning. At the same time, the daily life um, of my church, of our people here, of the churches, has not yet been affected by the bloodshed and persecution now facing many members of the Middle East Council of Churches. I therefore have a role to play in speaking out against the chaos and injustice faced by so many of our sisters and brothers in Christ in the Middle East. Secondly, I want you to know 
that Christians in the Middle East are often, especially in Palestine, harmed by some external efforts to describe or respond to the challenges we face. Over the crisis of the past few years, we have found that some Christians are taking the opportunity to claim Arab Christians as their children, treating us as damsels in distress who need to be rescued from our Muslim neighbors. Whether this sort of rhetoric comes from Russia, Europe, United States, Australia, or others, we Arab Palestinian Christians strongly reject this paternalistic neo-colonial approach. I think you know things have to be seen in a different in a different way. When we are speaking on Palestinian Christians, um, usually it's said that Palestinian Christians used to be 12 percent. Now their numbers have dropped less than 2 percent of the total population. So, so the questions, why are Palestinians, Palestinian Christians immigrating? And some are asking us, why only we speak on Palestinian Christians that are immigrating and why don't speak on Palestinian Muslims who are also immigrating? Well, I would like to tell you, if 10 Palestinian Christians immigrate, eight will remain outside and two will return back to their home. If 10 Muslim Christians immigrate, two will remain outside and eight will come back. So you can see the difference why we are immigrating. So why are people immigrating? You know, first I want to give some statistics. In November 2017, the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung released survey data regarding Christian and Muslim attitudes in the West Bank. The survey found that 23% Christians and 12% Muslims said that one of their relatives immigrated in the past year. The economic situation and political situation were the top reasons for immigration. Only 9% of, of Christians listed social or religious reasons. 28% of the Christian responded said they were considering immigrating themselves. An important survey was conducted also in 2008 among Palestinian Christians in the West Bank. Immigration was a clear top topic of the concern. Christian families who were seriously considering immigration out of Palestine were asked to state the reasons. I, I mean, I just give the findings and then I go back to the four main reasons, 32% they say the lack of freedom and security. 26% deteriorating economy. 19.4% political instability. Only a very few, less than 1% listed religious extremism as a factor in their decision to immigrate. In other words, Religious pressure from Muslim neighbors has very little to do with the most pressing concerns of Palestinian Christians in Israel and Palestine. So what are the four main reasons of immigration? I think, you know, first, there is no peace in the horizon. And we don't think there is a willingness by the international community to find peace based on justice in Jerusalem or in, in the Holy Land or in Israel and Palestine. And we are seeing that, you know, things are going not in the right way. So people are seeing no hope. And usually our people prefer to immigrate either Australia or United States or Canada. Europe does not take, well. I mean, Latin America used to take, you know, and it's not stable there, but it, the second reason is the deteriorating economic situation in Palestine. I mean, the condition of Palestinian life have made many of our young people concerned about their economic future. You know, 
Sabil has gathered some young Christians uh, to speak what are their needs in Jerusalem. And we find that the economic situation is very dire. I mean, some people, you know, cannot even pay the rent because I mean, there is no work, there are no jobs. And some say that nearly, you know, 30% of our young educated, uh, uh, young, of our young educated under 30 years old are unemployed. So you can understand that the economic situation plays a big role. But the thirdly, I think which is very important to understand the measures of occupation. The measures of occupation are very serious. I think when we speak about the measures of occupation, people maybe uh, uh, do not. For those of you who lived here, they can see the difficulties of the check posts. So if you are from the West Bank or Gaza, you need a permit. And if you are if you are under a certain age, you cannot easily get the permit. And sometimes you have to queue three to four hours, you know, in the sun, just really to come to your, you know, uh, uh, to come to your turn in order to apply for for a, for a permit. It can be for one day or one week maximum if you don't work here and so on. So people do not feel, you know, this is a one of the measures. The second thing is property confiscation. You have seen what's going in Sheikh Jarrah. You have seen what's going in Silwan, what's going in various parts of uh, in, in Jerusalem or in the West Bank, the settlements, you know, uh, the, the settlements, you know, uh, you remember as Sabil has written about a, an elderly man, 80 years old, who 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 holds an American, you know, citizenship? They went to his home, and they told them, "You cannot dismiss me of my home near Ramallah." And they uh, blinded him and detained him. And after one hour, they found him dead. So I mean, this is just yesterday was his funeral. So these measures of and also confiscating Palestinian land in the West Bank and building more settlements and in East Jerusalem. So you feel there is no space for you to. The Judaization of Jerusalem, the Israelization of Jerusalem. You know, um, since Mr. Trump has raised the issue of, um, uh, they said that has said that Jerusalem is the eternal capital of, uh, and, uh, of, of, of the Jewish people. We are seeing legal, you know, measures are taken to prove that it is, you know, majorly Jewish. And we are seeing every day, you know, intrusions into Al-Aqsa Mosque, you know, uh, where uh, the fear of the Muslim community that it will be divided uh, either by time or by space. And of course, they are very, very, very worried. Uh, we are seeing, uh, you know, that, uh, the the uh, the rules and regulations are becoming much more tougher building permits you know uh, some people say israel has given to palestinians uh, uh, since 67 only 2000 building permits you know so i mean all these measures make the lives of palestinians in general including palestinian christians you see a difficult one you say you because you are not measured by your religion you are dealt with accord that you are a Palestinian, you see. Uh, home demolitions, you know, um, um, non-existing building permits. You know, one of the serious issues which we Palestinian Christians are facing is the reunification permit. Now, what does reunification permit mean? You know, the natural expansion of Palestinian Christians, in, including Muslims, but I would like to uh, uh, to to um, focus on Palestinian Christians. Is you know uh, in Jerusalem is in the West Bank. So, if a young 
person wants to find their spouse, they usually find them in the West Bank, in Bethlehem or Ramallah, not in Galilee, because that's our natural, you know, expansion. So when you are married, and what the church, you know, uh, um, um, uh, legalizes, and it's applied then to the to the Ministry of Interior in in, in Israel. Um, of course, they will they will accept that you are married, but they don't write with whom you are married. And when you get children, you see, the children are registered in the ID of the West Banker, not in the ID of the Jerusalemite. So if you are lucky and you are over 25 and 35, you may get, you know, temporary residency, which means you cannot drive, uh, you cannot have social securities. Uh, you can only enter Jerusalem and live with your spouse and with your children. Also the children will be West Bankers, you see. So, and if you are not lucky, which mostly is the case, because you cannot prove that the center of your life is in the, in the Israeli boundaries of Jerusalem, then you opt either to continue this, you know, um, uh, inhuman situation or to pack and leave and immigrate. You cannot live. If you are in Australia or in Canada or United States, you are a citizen. It's no more, whatever is your background is not important. You're a citizen. And so, I mean, that reunification permit is a problem. And now we are facing it more, more seriously. Six months ago, the Knesset voted against that rule that was in 2003. However, you know, the Minister of uh, Interior is tomorrow, uh, uh, bringing to the Knesset to vote for this law, not to give Palestinians neither in Israel or in, um, in Jerusalem, uh, you know, any kind of residency. So it, they, she will close the door if she succeeds tomorrow or next week in the Knesset. Mm -hmm. So this is inhuman. I mean, th that means, I mean, that means they want the land, but not the people. They want Jerusalem, but not the Jerusalemites. And that's unexpected. And this reunification permit is majorly affecting, you know, the Palestinian Christian community. You know, I know that Pope Francis raised it when he visited. I know that Archbishop Justin raised it. I raised it when I was the, Arch the president of the Lutheran Federation. You know, um, 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 the Orthodox raised it. We all raise this issue, but we don't see a change because it seems there is a policy. So all of these together, you know, they create an atmosphere of hopelessness for the young Palestinian Christians and for the elderly. Finally, the fourth main reason for the immigration of Christians is the growth of extremism on all sides of the conflict has forced many peace-loving Christians to seek safer environments in which they raise their families. Well, we are dumped now with extremism. And extremism is, you can find it on all sides because of, you know, like Martin Martin, uh, uh, Professor Martin Marty has written that extremism grows where there's injustice and poverty. And that's true. Extremism is growing also in Palestinian society. I'm not denying that. And as long as there is no justice, extremism will continue to grow if we like it or not. So it's very important, you know, on the Israeli side, it's also growing. It's not really decreasing. So you find from the data that the main reasons for Christian immigration away from Palestine is a lack of freedom, and deteriorating economic prospects are tied directly to the experience of the Israeli occupation. This is a long-term and harmful trend. Well, I also want to 
to say that. You know that three years ago, there were, you know, some, uh, there were a law which was launched in the Knesset. You know, one of the, there are two laws. One of them was by saying that Christians are not Arabs in Israel. They are Arameans. Well, and you will be surprised. The, the argument was in the Knesset at that time that uh, if they are Arameans, maybe they will get more rights. But in fact, we are not Arameans. We are Arab Palestinians. And in fact, in the registry of the Ministry of Interior, there is only one family which is registered Aramean. So, I mean, we are not Arameans. I mean, don't really change our identity and our identity. The second thing is the basic law in 2017. The basic law is harmful for the peace process, including for the Christian presence. When it says that, uh, th that the right of self-determination in the historic Palestine is only for the Jewish people. This is harmful. And we have raised our voices, but who listens? And we are seeing, you know, that, I mean, this country is for the three religions and for the two nations. And you cannot just really come and say it's exclusively for one nation and one religion. That will never bring peace to the area. And that's which is very important to understand. This basic law is very dangerous for us and for the peace process and for those who are working for peace based on justice. And we are seeing it's difficult. You know, there is another idea which is very important uh, for us, you know, uh, living here in this part of the world. Some people like to call us minority. You know, we don't like to be minority. Or some people like to call us, you know, Dhimme. Dhimme means you are subject to the Sharia law. That means you are accepted under the Sharia law. Or some will consider us a mille. A mille is an autonomous community allowed by the Sharia law. I mean, these three understanding for us as Palestinian Christians are not accepted. Yes, we know that our numbers are small, but you never consider, you know, any community by its, by, by its numbers. You consider the community that they are equal citizenship. This is the reason, the challenge today for us Palestinian Christians, both in Palestine and Israel, is to promote the notions of equal citizenship with equal rights that embraces diversity. That is for us very basic. We won't accept to be neither mille, nor, nor dhimme, nor minority. We know that some oh, minority Christian. No, I'm not a minority. I'm an integral part of the Palestinian people. And I, want, and I don't have the ghetto mentality. And I don't have the complex of a minority. When I speak on Palestinian Christians, on Palestinian, I speak as a full citizen of my country. And that is very important for us to emphasize and to implant it in our people, not to resort to the complexity of being a minority. I'm not a minority. And I don't want to be protected by any religion. I want to be protected by a democratic law by the state, which secures every citizen's rights, whatever their religion, whatever their ethnicity, whatever their denomination, whatever their way of thinking. And that is for us very essential, not only in Palestine, but in the whole Middle East. You know, when, when I was invited 
to Marrakesh by uh, uh, by uh, uh, Sheikh uh, Abdullah ben Baya to uh, to speak on the the the, the topic of uh, um, of the role of religious minorities in the Muslim under the Muslim rule. I stood in front of 500 muftis and Muslim scholars to say, I don't accept this theme. I don't accept it. I am not a minority. You have to change your mentality from considering us minority to speaking about equal citizenship with equal rights and equal responsibility that embraces diversity. And if you open now, the Marrakesh Declaration on your internet, you'll find that the final communique emphasized this thing. They changed the, they changed what I've said. And that's what we have all to work for, for it. This which will make a new Middle East, which embraces every community, everybody, every human being. That's very essential for us, you know, in this part of the world. Now, you know, um, I want just to say something about what happened in the last month, which is still going on. You know, the heads of churches, and I'm sure you have seen that, wrote a statement prior to, uh, to Christmas, where they said they are worried about the future of Christians because there are, you know, extremist Israeli settlers who want to change the nature of East Jerusalem. And of course, they said, we are not claiming there is no freedom of religion in Israel or Palestine. We are saying that these extremist settlers Israeli settlers, they want to drive us from home. Of course, this was picked up by Archbishop Justin, and there was a statement by Justin and Hossam. And of course, in the British media, it was, it was well covered. And uh, here in Israel, it was very well covered. In the Arab media, it was well covered. So why did the heads of churches now all of a sudden woke up and spoke on this issue. And why are they so now? There are, you know, many reasons for this. Well, I've mentioned some already, but what it brought them is that, I don't know if you, some of you who know uh, East Jerusalem, but since last July until today, the new gate, which belongs to the Franciscans and the Orthodox, has been used by the Israeli municipality for either bring, playing backgammon or by having, you know, some kind of Israeli pop music every Wednesday and Thursday and making lectures, you know, by, by you know, uh, by uh, some Zionist, you know, thinkers at, at, at Newgate, where it is, you know, it belongs to Christians. And of course, it has harmed many of these people, you know, who are there. Secondly, you know, the heads of churches have seen that whenever they walk with their crosses in East Jerusalem, they are, sp sp they, they, are uh, they, sp they spit on them. I've experienced once when I was, many times I experienced it and always I said, may God forgive them. I didn't want to fight. You know, what, what will the fight bring for you? See, I know that carrying this cross has always a price, you know, but, but it shows, it's a hate crime. It shows what are they educated. One of them told me, because you don't believe in God, you believe in idols. Another thing, you know, is which is uh, which which is, which brings why heads of churches is the illegal twisted deals 
for the Orthodox at, at Jaffa Gate. So the two hotels, Petra and Imperial, if taken by those, by Karen Kaimet, by those settler movements, that means, you know, those radicals will control East Jerusalem, which is the root of pilgrimage to the, to the, to the Holy Sepulchre. And that will, of course, make it more difficult for local and international and ecumenical pilgrimage to enter to Jerusalem, to East Jerusalem. So, I mean, when you are seeing that your property, which has been, which belonged to the churches for so long a time, is have twisted deals. This is the reason the Greek Orthodox Patriarch is strongly speaking today all over the world. Even he spoke, you know, in front of the president of Israel uh, in their, you know, annual, uh, annual New Year's, you know, reception. He spoke this week. We are afraid for our from those extremists. You know, you know I have a list of attacks on holy Christian holy places in Israel and in East Jerusalem in, from 2012 until today, yeah, including Tabga. What is very interesting that none of the perpetrators who are known to the police were punished. What kind? I mean, they live in the privilege of impunity. And so, I mean, when they are not punished, of course. So we are asking, you know, as heads of churches, and we are asking as Christians, what kind of education? I mean, I will respect every holy place for Jews, for Muslims, for any religion. I mean, it's my duty as a Christian, as a human being. I know not everybody can be a Lutheran, you see, but also I know that I have to respect the diversity because God did not create us only Lutherans, but created us, you know, with different denominations, with different races, with different ethnicities. And I have to respect other religions and to respect their holy places. This is key for human rights. This is key for, for living together in any part of the world, you see, to respect the other who is different and to give them their full human rights. And that is the reason why heads of churches now. Now, you would be surprised to hear also that the Russians, there is an Orthodox Interparliamentary Council who has written a letter supporting the heads of churches, including Patriarch Theophilus of the Orthodox Church for the, now it's becoming, to, it's becoming political. In a way, it's good that it's becoming political, but you know, it is really harming, you know, to see that those extremists are there. Now, you may ask me, is there only Muslim and Jewish extremists and there are also Christian extremists? Yes, there are, and we don't deny it. But mostly those Christian extremists are coming to us from outside. They are the Christian Zionists who deny me my rights to be in Jerusalem or to be in this country. They think I'm an intruder and they are really reading the biblical text in their own way, in a twisted way, in a, in a non-traditional way. They are reading it and, uh, and they, are, they don't see that I have any rights in Jerusalem as a human being, neither Palestinian, because they think the land is given, you know, uh, by God to one nation. And of course, I know that this Christian Zionist movement is harmful. And in fact, which I always say, they are a false teaching. Even they are a heresy. Why? Because I think, you know, every Sunday we confess 
in our creed that Christ will come back to, to judge the living and the dead. We never say Christ will come back to make excursions. We never say that Christ will come back to give one land to one country and refuse the other, you see. And for me, they are against the Christian church. They are heresies. And they are living in their closed-minded scenarios. So in a way, for the long run, they neither like Jews, nor Christians, nor Muslims. They are imprisoned in their or sick ideologies and sick scenarios. And they are harmful to our case in this part of the world. And they harm even all the relations which we are building together. So if I ask, why is it important that we Christian community in this part of the world will continue to, to not only to survive, but to thrive? You know, for me to be a Palestinian Christian in this part of the world is not a call for a presence. It's a call for witness. Christ never told me, come, and stay in Jerusalem. Christ told me to be a living witness in Jerusalem. So the Palestinian Christian presence is a living witness of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is the reason as a Palestinian Christian, as an Arab Palestinian Christian, I consider myself to be, to be, you know, an instrument of peace a broker of justice, a defender of human rights, including gender justice, a, an initiator of dialogue, a minister of reconciliation, and an apostle of love. This is my call. And the more I feel my call, the more I love my country and my people. And that is what we have to see. Why is it important to keep the Christian witness in this part of the world, you know, not only because of the holy places, but because of the holy call, which we have it. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, um, Bishop Manoop. That's been um, an excellent introduction for us. And um, your passion was clear and appropriate and well-directed. Um, I especially valued your comments on equal citizenship, which embraces diversity, rather than being put in a special glass case as a minority or a Zimmi or a Malay community. Um, and I think that speaks to other issues of um, ethnic diversity and cultural diversity in different parts of the countries around the world as well. And also particularly thank you for the um, um, elaboration on the recent and uncharacteristic activity by the heads of churches who have often been noticeable more by their quietness than by their um, uh, being outspoken. And um, um, thank you for that explanation. And um, uh, I'm sure it's helped us all to understand the, the cumulative effect of a number of um, events and dynamics which have compounded, compounded over the years to a, a more um, extremist and uh, fractious context at the moment. We, we have about 20 minutes left for questions and um, um, someone has commented that passion was a word that also occurred to them as they were listening to you. Um, you. I want to... I want to stay with a, a question that has gained some attention in Australia in the last few weeks. Um, the Sydney Festival, which is a artistic and cultural festival, which happens every year, has recently had a significant um, BDS um, event where a number of acts, 20 or more than 20 different um, artistic acts withdrew from the festival in protest at some funding, which the festival received from the Israeli embassy. 
And part of the response to that has been um, a whipping up of anti-BDS sentiment. Um, the shadow, um, shadow minister, so from the Labour Party, supposedly from the progressive left-wing side of politics in New South Wales, I think it was the shadow minister for the arts, called upon the government to introduce US-style anti-BDS legislation in Sydney. We have our man Mark down there to make sure this doesn't happen. But I was just wondering, um, at the present time, what, are, what is the point of view of perhaps the heads of churches, but more particularly, what is your point of view on BDS as a um, strategy for change? <coughs> Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I think, you know, first of all, the BDS is considered internationally to be a nonviolent way to protest any kind of injustice. However, among us Palestinian Christians and Palestinians in general, we have maybe different schools of thinking, you know, and we have to admit that uh, we respect each other's, you know, uh, um, we cannot impose on the other what they have to think. Some think, you know, that uh, um, uh, some think that there should be hermetic uh, um, uh, BDS against the state of Israel. Uh, some others, including in a way the heads of churches, and which I know, but of course they don't speak it publicly because I used to be one of them. They think only the settlements should be boycotted because the settlements are illegal, internationally illegal, and anything produced in them is illegal. So, I mean, these are, uh, these are the two schools which are existing, you know, among, among us Palestinians in general, including Palestinian Christians, we are part of this nation. So, I mean, uh, 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 so, I mean, um, and we, of course, we still um, um, insist that uh, the settlements, uh, I mean, uh, the BDS on the settlements is very important to save the two-state solution and for the peace process. Um, and uh, of course, this has been disturbing Israel. And of course, it has been sometimes, you know, um, blended to be anti-Semitic, you see. Um, and we know that many governments were not helpful or even parliaments who did not really take it as a human rights issue, like Germany, the Bundestag, you know, has voted for it, or, 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 or Canada, or, or United States, and, and of course there are other European countries, you know, and, and this is a political issue. It's not something which is, you know, against, uh, um, in no way, I think, you, know, we, you must be, you always must understand, even as a Palestinian living under the Israeli occupation, we will never allow anti-Semitic, you know, to come to our society. You know, we are, we love the Jewish people. We are against the occupation. This is, these are two different things, you see, and we must separate them. We must separate them. And, you know, the BDS, for example, for the West Bank, you see, settlements, which are illegal, you know, will is also, good for justice to show that the world is moving for justice you know this is maybe the only non-violent way which remains in the hands of you know the palestinians at the moment and of course it's denied by the world and for me that is what i think about it now we don't impose it any country we don't have any people it's up to you whatever you think it's right to do what is right for justice and that is my position, you see, and people ask me, do you support here, what, or here, or there? I said, it's up to you. What do you think helps the justice? And what I mean for justice, I don't mean it only for Palestinians. I also want justice for Israelis. That's very important to understand, you know, as a Christian leader, I want justice for both nations. And justice is to give everyone their own rights, you know, and to respect their holy places. Thank you. Um, I think that reflects very much some of the conversations that go on uh, in church communities, but also within Palestinian advocacy right. organizations in Australia. There's, um, there's this 
this um, angst about how to how to best engage with BDS without um, becoming seen to be anti-Israel or even worse, anti-Jewish. Mm. Um, there's a question actually that's come from the Sabeel Center in Jerusalem. So I, I will take that one. It's, an, it's a question more about Christian Zionism. And the question is, why is Christian Zionism becoming more popular in the global South? Um, I'm, I'm not sure whether you uh, would even see it that way, but what's your, what's your thought about the, the, the uh, current dynamics of um, a sympathy for exclusive Jewish possession of Palestine mm. um, based on religious? Yeah. And we've heard what you've said about um, Christian Zionism being heretical, but what do you see about the sort of demographic yeah. of that theological opinion? Yeah. yeah. First of all, we must also admit that uh, the Christian, uh, the Christian communist, uh, sorry, the Christian Zionist groups in uh, in the West, you know, are very active. No, are sure, very active sure. in various parts of the world, and they have their own arguments. That's one reason. The second reason, which is very serious, and you know, I've been. Uh, visiting, you know, in my position as president of LWF, Africa and Asia and Latin America, you know, and even East Europe, you know, quite a lot and been speaking with the people. Uh, in a way, you know, I understand their fear and understand where they come from. Although I had arguments with them is how do you read the Bible and the Old Testament. How do you interpret it? Usually when an African, you see, or an Asian who are really, in a way, they are conservatives in their own faith and loyal to the biblical text. When they read that Israel, God gave the land to Israel, they cannot separate between the political Israel of today and the biblical Israel of that, of, of the biblical Israel. And that is that, you know, kind of picture, the Christian Zionist groups are investing in it. <clears throat> and this is the reason maybe we have not been active, you know, those of us who have the right reading of the biblical text, the right understanding of the parousia. We have not been good missionaries as the others. And we have really to teach these people, please separate, you know, between both. You know, I was lecturing in the university in, in the United States of America, for example, in the Bible Belt. And uh, I was speaking, they asked, I was speaking on Christian Zionism and explaining this, 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 uh, these things. Then after I finished my lecture, uh, a young man, 23 years old, come to me, uh, comes to me and asked me, Bishop, you convinced me, I, am, I grew up in the conservative, and I believe conservatism is the right way. And, uh, um, but, you know, convince me that the biblical Israel is different than this political Israel. For me, it's one and the same. I mean, this is what many of our people, loving people in the South, the global South, <clears throat> are taking. And we have not really given them, you know, the right version of our understanding of the biblical text. And that is that what we have to do. And that is the reason of that. These, uh, that, that is, maybe there is naivety. There isn't a political you know, intrigues behind it. There is naivety of reading the Bible. And we have to take this naivety in a positive way. And maybe we have to be missionaries to them to explain to them how to read the Bible in the right way. I mean, we have also some Palestinian Christian Zionists among us, very small group. You know, but they were really, uh, if I say very frankly here and in a group of friends, it is uh, what motivates them, you see, is the funds they are getting from them. It's not the funds they're getting, they, they are rich people, they have power, they have influence, and they have money. And we, the church, we don't have funds, we don't have influence, and we don't have money. And you can, you can understand, these people play with the money. The problem is, I mean, for the global South, their naivety 
for me is a holy thing and we have to work with them on this issue and you know i know when when i spoke with africans and with asians whom i love and i really they are dear to me then they understood they changed their mind and it is our mission work to do that for for the sake of christ not only for the sake of justice Sure. Let, let me invite you to extend that a little bit. When I was living in Jerusalem for a couple of years and many other times, of course, when I've been um, in the country, um, particularly, it struck me particularly when I would worship at St. Luke's Church in Haifa with my friend Hatam Shahadi. And I would say to Hatam, Hatam, why do you ignore the Old Testament reading in the liturgy? Mm. hardly ever gets read in church mm. hardly ever gets addressed in the homily um, and yet there is no community of people anywhere in the christian church who will better understand the hebrew scriptures mm. than the people of palestine mm. who are not only arabs but most of them speak hebrew mm. now i understand it's very difficult for a palestinian to engage constructively with the Tanakh, with the Jewish scriptures. And yet my uh, unsolved question, my unsolved argument with Hatam was and is that um, the rest of the world will be greatly blessed if Palestinian Christians would show us how to read the Old Testament in a different way. And I think that's more or less what you were suggesting in your- Well, well what I would like to say also on, with us Palestinians, especially the evangelicals now, we have also different schools, you see. Sure. There is a school which says, I don't want anything to do with the Old Testament, you see. I represent a school which says, I want to teach my children the Old Testament and in the right way, you know. And in my church, the Lutheran church, I kept the Old Testament readings and we have to read them because for me as a Lutheran, you know, what Martin Luther said, was Christum, the Old Testament only inculculates Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I cannot understand the new without the old or the old without the new. And that for me, that is very essential. And I mean, I'm not disturbed in the church when I read the Old Testament. On the contrary, another reason, the Old Testament is much nearer to my mentality and culture as a Palestinian Christian and Semitic than the complicated Pauline Hellenistic, you know, <laughs> theology. Yeah. You know, my culture is in the Old Testament, is not in the New Testament. As a Palestinian Christian, mm -hmm. the way of mentality, the way of retribution, the way of you know uh, understanding things, even I mean simple things, you know. Just for you to tell you about the Old Testament, I love the Old Testament because it was my major in the university. That means 50 years ago, not today. You know, um, uh, for example, when we built, uh, you know, a, a, our own houses, when you put the roof, you know, and put cement on the roof, you have always to slay a ram and the blood should touch, you know, the cement which you are, the concrete which you are pouring there. Where does it come from? From the Old Testament, you know, yeah. and we, we do it, even Muslims do it and Christians, do, but they don't understand. So my culture is there. I love the Old Testament and we should not really allow, you know, those Christian Zionists or those who misinterpret the Old Testament to kidnap the Old Testament from us. No, my the Old Testament is the book of the church. It's my book. And yeah. I will never allow those wrong interpretations really to, to, to prevail. On the contrary, I have to teach what is what the whole church has taught for the last two to uh, two thousand years to find Christ in the Old Testament and nothing more. What Martin Luther said, those difficult texts, I will raise my hat and say, God bless them and just go forward. I don't care. I care because God is the same God, the God of love and justice in the Old Testament and the New Testament. As an Old Testament lecturer, I'm delighted <laughs> to hear your comments. We're getting very, very close to the end. I wonder if we might just ask you to comment on where do you see hope? What's for you is the, the seed of hope for the Palestinian community? Yeah, thank you very much. Well, 
you know, let me tell about myself. If I don't have hope, and if I lost hope, you will never find me in Jerusalem. You will find me in Australia or in uh, uh, Washington DC or somewhere else, you see, or in Europe, in Finland maybe, you see where I studied. You know, we have not to lose hope. As always I say, as long as there is a living God, a God of love, a God of justice, there is hope for Palestinians. And hope must not be measured by time. Hope is that keeps us going all the time and keeps our Christian evangelical mission and call to continue in this part of the world. As long I, I live in this country with God's grace and with his call for me, this is my hope. And that's the hope of the Palestinians. Okay, shukran. Yeah. Shukran, Afwin. So friends, I think we'll begin to wrap it up. I wonder if we might just call to mind a few points for prayer and action as this session draws to a close. Um, I'm conscious of so many of the um, uh, incidents and provocations that were described briefly before by the bishop. Conscious also of the, uh, the struggle, the grassroots struggle for equal citizenship for all the peoples of historical Palestine, Jews, Christians, and Muslims. Conscious as well for the heads of churches as they seek to not only lead their own communities, but also to be agents for justice and agents for hope. Uh, and, and we pray as well for those, um, particularly I think it's the Tent of Promise people who are, whose case is going back to court, uh, perhaps tomorrow um, in Jerusalem, and we pray for justice for them as well. And uh, we give thanks for the positive relationships, which are the hallmark of the community of Palestinians, overwhelmingly Muslim people these days. And we give thanks that the um, so few Christians would consider migration on the basis of religious tension and extremism. And we pray for justice, we pray for hope, and we pray for goodwill between all the peoples of the land. And, um, and we ground that hope in the character of God rather than in our own wisdom and capacity. Amen. Amen, thank you. I've got about 30 seconds left. So let me just mention what we're doing next time. So these events are on the basically, typically the third Saturday, the middle Saturday of the, of the odd numbered months. So our next webinar will be on the 19th of March, which I think happens to be the feast of St. Joseph of, of yes, Nazareth. And partly for that reason, we're going to have Violet Khori join us to speak about uh, Nazareth today. And, um, and in, not only her work with Sabil, but more recently her work with uh, Nazid Una, uh, which is a, um, a local women's association in Nazareth, seeking to preserve and develop and uh, sustain local heritage from the Palestinian communities in, in that part of the country. Those of you who have met Violette will know what a powerful woman she is and a very dear friend of mine and very much looking forward to having Violette with us in a couple of months time. But today, um, thank you to you, Bishop, for your you presentation. For and I look forward to having coffee with you, um, inshallah, in Jerusalem soon. In or in thank Australia. <laughs> oh, well, welcome in Australia, but I <laughs> hope and pray for us please pray for us we, we need your prayers we do, we do. thank you always. god bless you thank you. god bless you okay